so nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm Chris, uh, Head of Operations for First West of England. The West of England doesn't include Taunton or Exeter or Cornwall or any of those places. It really is what used to be called Avon, which is Bristol, Bath, and so I cover Bath, Western Supermare, Wells, the smallest city in England. Uh, if you haven't been there, you should, because it's very pretty. And uh, South Gloucestershire, so stuff out towards Yate and Thornbury. Um, one of the things I wanted to do really quickly, just before I get going, is, is to explain what the changes were that we made this year and kind of why we made them, and also a very, very brief understanding of what our service is. Because a lot of people think that we operate buses, therefore we must be funded heavily by the government, which we're not, I wish we were, but we're not. Um, we are a private commercial operator, so we are part of First Group PLC, which is a multinational company, so we operate buses in America, uh, trains in the UK, so GWR is part of the same company, um, and we are based in Bristol, so I'm one of the senior managers of First West of England Limited. James Freeman's our managing director. He's a Bathonian, so lives in a very nice place in Lansdowne, uh, overlooking the city. So we, we kind of understand the area, and I think that's really important. Um, we get very little funding uh, for the operation that we do in Bath generally, so some services attended, the 20, which some of you may have got from the university, that's attended service from the council. But most of what we do is entirely paid for by the fares that we collect on the bus. And that can be a challenge, particularly for a service like Bath University, which requires an immense amount of resource to make it work. And it is a huge amount of resource. And unfortunately, that resource sits in our depot for 52 weeks of the year but is really only used by the majority of students for 35 to 36 weeks of the year. So we've got quite a narrow window to make quite a lot of money on this service to make it pay its way. And that's what our goal is, is to provide you with a sustainable service, to provide the university with a sustainable service that actually meets your needs but is not draining our bank balance. So we listened very carefully to the feedback that we had from last year, which we... I was very lucky-ish in that I was promoted to this job uh, last April where the decision on what services we ran in the University of Bath had already been made. And I was a bit dubious about it, I'm going to be quite honest, um, that the route decisions that had been made was a bit odd and that from my time as a staff manager in Bath five years previous, I thought, well, that kind of worked quite well then, so I don't really know why we reinvented the wheel. Um, I wish I could say that I enjoyed the I told you so moment, but I didn't. Uh, last year we wanted to apologise and this is a really good opportunity for us to be able to do so because we made a, more, a mess of it. A couple of things went wrong, more people travelling than we expected by quite a large proportion and the route change was not very good and not particularly appropriate. So this year we were very, very, very keen to make sure that we didn't repeat the mistakes of last year and we listened to a lot of the feedback that we had from the changes that we made in January where we reintroduced the X1X as it was called, and added some more time to the U2. Apologies if you weren't here last year, you'll have literally no idea what I'm talking about, but um, trust me, you want to be grateful that it's, it's better now than it was last year. So the things that we did were keep that separation of the service between the university campus and Oldfield Park and the university campus and the city centre for an all day long. So it used to only be in the peak times. We introduced something called the U3, which is the U1X, but with a different number. Um, that runs all day long now, so that runs between 7 in the morning and 7 at night. Uh, the U1 then just runs to the city centre and back uh, during the main part of the day, Monday to Friday. It's only on an evening, early mornings, and on Saturdays and Sundays when we do what we call the classic U1, which is Oldfield Park, city centre, and up to the university. Now, that change may not feel particularly significant, but the biggest change with that is that the off-peak... So where we used to see an immense peak operation, i.e. 8 o'clock in the morning was when we needed loads and loads of buses out there, and we could drop that off quite substantially off-peak so they could go back to the depot, be service, do whatever with. That hasn't been the case in the last two years, so we've got a lot more buses out during the main part of the day than we did last year. To the tune of around eight additional buses are out there during the day than were out there last year, uh, during the off-peak. And during the peak time, it's about another... Th about another 10, something like that. So it's quite substantial. And with the U2, we last year ran it with four vehicles on the cycle. So you've got four vehicles working the timetable and it siphons round. Um, we've added a lot more time to it this year, which has meant we actually now have seven buses on that cycle rather than four. 
And we've also introduced what last year, the R2. And the R2 takes, the idea is that it takes the school children away from the U2 because we know that school children tend to take up a lot of space on the bus. It's not your desired people to sit on when you go up to university and their needs are different than yours. So it was really important. So what we've done is added significant amount of extra resource to the service this year. Um, you'll see that there are some buses that aren't part of the first fleet, i.e. they're different colours, different operators. We've employed those people, but unlike last year where we did it at a bit of a fire sale of, oh my God, what the hell has happened, we need to find somebody quickly, and we've got coaches and all sorts of inappropriate things. This year we've got buses, they've got our ticket machines on them, so that we're not losing any revenue, because one of the key factors that we're focused on is making sure that all of you honest people that are paying your fares are great, but there was a fair amount of people that were being waved on, and that's a lot of our fault because we were just desperate to get people gone. This year, we focused on two things, providing extra resource and making sure that we're collecting the fares that we need to, because it isn't fair on people like your good selves that pay the right amount to have to substitute those that don't. That's the biggest changes so far. Very early days, and pride comes before a fall, is for saying that hasn't come across you yourselves if you ever work in the bus industry, will. But I'm very pleased with the results so far. We're not there. We're not 100% perfect, but I think we can all hopefully agree that it's a much better place than last year. I look forward to getting some feedback from you all this evening, and we've got some questions we'd like to pose to you as well. So I think I'll hand back to Andrew, but thank you for listening, if nothing else. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, Steve, over to you. I think you made your Instagram debut. Yeah, I, I, I was very nervous about going on Instagram, I, and probably for those of you who've had the misfortune to see it, you can easily see that. Uh, but I was um, really pleased with the kind of response that we got. And in the first day, I think we had 4,400 views. So people were really finding it useful and uh, asking questions and, and getting some, some the answers that they needed. I, I know last year, a lot of people felt frustrated that they asked questions or they made complaints and they didn't feel like you know anything was coming back. I think uh, first, we're a little overwhelmed, if I'm honest, with the level of complaints. Uh, I, I was talking to you, you probably got fed up with me every day telling you what the problems were. Um, to be fair, you did listen, you did make some changes, you did make some investments, they did take some time to come through. Uh, and this year I think we're seeing the, the benefits of, of, of all of that. There isn't much help for those who had to suffer last year, but, but thank you anyway for this year. Um, from our part, we've done a number of things. Uh, the most obvious is the remodelling of the arrivals square. Um, the bendy buses, which uh, you use quite a bit, uh, weren't around when we originally designed that square, and therefore the square itself wasn't designed to take that. And it wasn't designed to take the additional buses that you've now put on. So. We put some investment in to make that possible and also to make it easier for people with disabilities to, to get on the, the buses. Um, and alongside that, um, my exp I use the bus, so I, I, I understand some of the queuing issues. And it's always frustrating when you see like three buses and you, you have to wait in the queue and then the next one gets loaded and the next one gets loaded. So, uh, and then somebody in front of you, and it's normally me if I'm honest, sort of gets their cash out rather than uses their machine. And so it all takes far longer than it really should. Uh, so we've introduced um, a, a couple of new guys, Kevin uh, and Stephen, and they've got the yellow jackets and they're working alongside Neville to help people get ready to go on the bus and to load the buses at the same time rather than sequentially. That doesn't sound like a big change, but actually it is, because those buses can be loaded quickly. People are ready with their, with their phones, they're ready with their payments, uh, they're on the bus quickly, two or three buses can be loaded at once, and then we can get some new ones around, and that actually increases the capacity. And I know some of your colleagues are doing similar things, Rob, throughout the city, um, now, that's, this is the first time we've done this, so it's bound to be things that we can do better. And one of the things we'd love for you to tell us is, you know, your experiences of that. Is there something we could improve on? And we've got Mike here, Mike Porter from the security team, who, who can answer any specific questions, but also I know is, is keen to know how it's, how it's worked uh, for you uh, and whether or not that, that can be better. One, one of the things that 
Rob also mentioned was one of the difficulties is variability in demand. So uh, at peak, there's something like 14,000 passenger movements a day at peak, but it can be 20,000, is it? Gosh, it's gone up. Um, I thought it was 14, uh, but 20,000. 20,000 passenger movements at peak a day. But it varies enormously between days. So Tuesday is much more, much is the busiest day. Monday and Friday and Wednesday are less busy and Thursday is busy as well. And then it changes throughout the day. It changes throughout the semester. It changes between semester and non-semester time. And predicting how much, how many buses to put on in order to meet the demand is, is a real science. Now, we've got some excellent mathematicians and modelers, so we're trying to find a way of helping you do that demand because on the one hand, we want lots of buses so you can get here and you don't have to wait, but on the other hand, we don't want to see empty buses that are, uh, are, are increasing carbon emissions and affecting our climate. So we're trying to balance that and we're working on that. We've got a weekly meeting that tries to look at our demand forecasting and to see how we can improve it. So you get the best service, but we minimize the impact on, on climate. So uh, I've had lots of questions. Some of them uh, are very high-level questions and strategic questions, and some are things like, where does the U3 stop and stuff like that. Um, so please do feel free to answer any question. Ask any question. We'll answer the questions. But ask any question that is on your mind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, so just in terms of how the question and answer session will work, um, if you have a question, please can you uh, alert uh, Tommy, who has a mic, uh, and we'll be able to pass that uh, over to you. But uh, just to get things started, a question f uh, that we picked up, uh, I suppose came up as an early question on the arrivals weekend uh, for you, Chris, about what, what exactly is the, the cheapest way for uh, students to travel, particularly students living on campus, uh, what's the cheapest way for them to travel into town? Uh, well, the first thing to say on that is that the cheapest way to travel is always by buying your ticket on the First Bus app. No matter what ticket you're buying, it is cheaper on the app. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to buy an annual ticket or a uni year ticket. You can buy a day rider on the app, and it's 10p cheaper. Now, 10p doesn't sound like a lot, but actually you do that twice a week for 36 weeks, and actually it has saved you some money. Um, it also means you board quicker. So everybody that you see getting on the bus that just scans their phone, that also gives us a load of extra data. And the reason why that is cheaper than the normal ticket, if you like, is because of the fact that you board the bus quicker, because of the fact that we can use that data that's provided. So it's all anonymized, don't worry, nobody's kind of virtually stalking anybody. But it's all about being able to do what Steve is talking about, which is predict patterns, do that kind of thing. And also it takes paper away because paper tickets are a bit old hat. And if you stand at the arrival square, which I spent, not last week, in the weekend before, working to help regulate the buses, it was really obvious when someone was paying on the bus because all of a sudden there was this ginormous queue and, and it was all held up and people getting on. So if you're traveling more than, say, three or four times a week, a day rider is going to cost you, um, well, by that point, you've probably spent nine, ten pounds. Actually, your £329 ticket for the and uni year averages out at pound eighty a day, I think it is. So by the time you, if you do the maths, actually, once you travel more than three or four times a week into town, it might be cheaper for you to look at one of our season options. Um, doesn't bother me if you don't, because I get more money out of you. But in all seriousness, the app is the way to go. <laughs> the last year, the big difference that was better than this year is when we have training in the morning, there was a bus that left Oldfield at 6.40ish, which got to training on time. And the earliest bus that doesn't get you in too early is 7.04, which means you start training late. We can't tr start training for 7.30. Mm. So we, was, we were wondering if that was an option to restart, even move that bus 10 minutes earlier just so that people can get to 7.30 a.m. training is on time? Um, we actually moved that one as a request because we were told that the 6.40 was too late and that people wanted it earlier. Uh, so we, that's why we, one of the reasons we moved it. So there's a 6.03 
journey that leaves Oldfield Park that gets to the university at half past six. Now, I accept that if you're on a 7.30 train in, that's probably too late. Um, we were, I suspect that's times have changed or something because that was literally, as far as I'm aware, and Rob's ticket. It was direct request from the SU president to move the time. So I'll check with Eve and find out where that miscommunication came from. But um, in terms of moving it now, we're a little restricted. Um, the next available opportunity for us to change anything is January the 5th, because we're only allowed to change buses on specific dates of the year. So the next one available to us, although there is a change on the 10th of November, but we have to register everything 70 days in advance of that. And of course, 70 days is way past the 10th of November. So uh, any specific stuff like that, Rob, our operations manager, is taking a note of everything, and we'll certainly have a look into that, because that, we're quite happy mm. to do these things. Can, can I just clarify what would, be, what would really work for you? Because what you've, what you've said, Rob, is that there's one arriving at the university at half six, is that right? Yeah, so you've got, there's a six... So is that, is that too early, or, yeah? So what time so, does your training start? Always trained at 7.30. There used to be one that get, got in at 7.10 and one that got in at 7.20, but there's now only one and it gets in at 6.30 or 7.30. So they've just, the, it's just become more spaced rather than we had just two mm. that worked last year. We'll have to check that one because um, we, we definitely moved that for a reason. But I, I think as well, first, so. Rob, if you can talk to the SU, but also to the coaches at the STV because I know they arrange some training sessions. Yeah, we can do that. And what you might find is that one that somebody has wanted that particular time. Yeah, no problem. So it'd be good to just understand, you know, what ev what suits everybody as much as we can. Yeah, but I but mean, I know I know to be covered by myself or by our Rob our operations manager yeah. who's over there. Hi. Um, I think. Well, I, I wasn't here last year, so I didn't, haven't seen the comparison between the two, but I think the thing that's noticeable coming back is how much the price of the bus ticket has increased. Um, and understanding, A, why that is the case with lots of students, I don't know. I haven't been given real explanation of why that is the case. B, I don't know if there's any long-term plan with that price rise. For me, it seems very ad hoc year on year, since we're going to add it this much this year, we're going to add this much next year. And I think at least a rational understanding of why the price rises, you know, li linking it to inflation, something like that. Over, if, if, if this price now is working now, then why does it have to jump again, again so much in a year's time, let's say? So I think if this is the price now that you think is sustainable for your network, then I don't, what, can that rise in inflation year on year for a few years to give students certainty? Because cost of living is only going up. Rent prices have gone through the roof in Bath in the last, I know I'm paying... That's, again, that's something, that, again, the cost of living in this city, you notice every time you come back, just goes up and up. Um, and I think students obviously are struggling with that. And clarity on pricing um, <coughs> just goes a long way to, for students. Um, yeah, so, I mean, pricing-wise, um, we operate in a deregulated market. Uh, we're a commercial operator, so the pricing is entirely set by us. Um, and for all, the reason it went up on everything, so it's not just the university products, all of our tickets went up this year, um, for several reasons really, but most of them are exactly what you just said. So unfortunately, Bath particularly, but Bristol as well, has, a, as you know, very high cost of living. We really do struggle to recruit bus drivers in Bath, and bus drivers are our biggest cost. So they are really important, we want to get the right people, we don't just want any old uh, Tom, Dick or Harry, we want someone decent. Um, and we have to put our bus driver wages up year on year to remain competitive. We do generally pay our drivers slightly over the national average, and that's to be able to attract people that are living 20, 30 miles away. So our cost of wages and labour generally went up by about 5% this year, um, which is quite a bit higher than inflation, actually, because I think inflation was about 2.6%, 2.7%, something like that. Um, so it's, it's gone up quite a bit more than that. Um, as a result of that, we have actually got ourselves into a much more stable staffing situation than we've had in a long time, so that's a bit of a, a plus. Um, the other reason for that is the second biggest cost is fuel, and fuel went up 10% this year uh, versus last year. And that we buy fuel in a slightly different way than you might buy it in a 
petrol station, so we hedge our fuel, which is done by our head office and it's bought in advance. So they try and kind of minimise the unpredictable government saying, oh my God, the price of oil's gone up, so suddenly your fuel's going up. We won't see that for another six months afterwards, which allows us to then be able to try and budget for that process. And unfortunately, the only way we can raise more money to be able to pay for these things is by increasing the fare. The other thing is that we've added a lot more resource. So every single bus that we add to a service increases our cost line somewhere between the region of 150 to 200,000 pounds a year. That's another 150 to 200,000 pounds per year that we have to collect in additional revenue to pay for that. I can't give you the exact because we're a commercial operator, so I can't give you the exact figures, but I can tell you that the university service did not cover its cost of operations last year. And that's a problem because it's 40% of Bath Depot and Bath Depot has to sustain itself. It's no secret that we are part of a PLC that is considering whether to separate and sell the bus side of the business because it is simply not bringing in the volumes it means. Now, that's not to sound to depress you. That's a really honest and, and blunt answer, frankly. We don't like putting fares up. Fares going up are the last thing we needed to do, but we did have to invest quite significantly this year. And the other reason that we're going to have to look very carefully at what to do with fares in the future is there is something called the clean air zone lingering over our head. Now, the clean air zone is due to come in in 2021 and means that every bus, lorry and maybe car, maybe not, we're not going to go into that, um, will have to meet Euro 6 environmental standards. Now, no prizes for assuming that our Bendy buses do not meet Euro 6 standards. They are aged kit, they are not very good, and they need to go. So we've applied for a lot of government funding and we've already started upgrading a number of buses uh, in Bath. But unfortunately, your university service is made up of two types of bus. You have eight of the Euro 6 newer vehicles that you'll have seen with the screens and they look a bit nicer and they don't smell like a steam train when they come up a hill. And then you've got the bendy buses and the older double-deckers. They are Euro 3 and they are too old to upgrade. We've got to try and replace those vehicles somehow. And we've got to generate enough revenue to be able to do that. And each bus costs us about 220 to 230,000 pounds to replace. And we need to replace somewhere in the region of 18 just for the university service, let alone the rest of the buses in Bath. <clears throat> That's a challenge that we are facing, and we're working with the local authority, with DFT, to try and fund that. So I can't sit here now and say to you, I promise you that any future rise will go with inflation, because A, we don't know what inflation is going to do. We've got this lingering thing called Brexit over our head, which is causing me a bit of a labour problem, frankly. And we've got all sorts of other issues, but I can tell you that we don't just put fares up willy-nilly and that there is a reason behind it. We did release a press release to publicise why we'd done it. The Bath Chronicle published most of it, I believe, um, but obviously for students, that's not necessarily where you go to look for information of bus price rises. And perhaps the one thing we need to take away from that is that we need to be better at communicating that with you guys. That's not necessarily gonna help your pocket, of course, but it, at least understanding is one half of mm. the problem. I think, I hope that hasn't, thrown too many technicalities at you all, but that's the reason for the price rise. Uh, sticking with the subject of fares for a minute, I'm not going to go on that one again because you gave a, a good answer for that. Um, and I know some of the tube prices in London are thousands. So. Um, why is our bus pass the same price as Bath Cars, but theirs is valid for three weeks longer than us? That is a very good question. Um, we used to charge a different rate for them. So we used to charge Bath Spa students more than we charged the University of Bath. Um, they objected to it for similar reasons to you do, because, well, Bath University get a 24-hour-a-day service, and we don't. And Bath University get newer buses than we do, and we don't get that. And they've got a much more frequent service, and we don't. So there's, there's kind of swings and roundabouts. The, the product we provide to the two universities is very, very different. But... All we found what happened last year and the year before and the year before was that basketball students, because they're not daft, despite what people may think, they're not. Um, I was a UE student, so people used to think we were daft compared to University of Bristol. And they just bought the University of Bath ticket, which meant that we were very challenged to understand which ticket actually made more money. We also had people buying UE tickets 
because they were based on a similar zoning. So what we've done is standardised our university product across the whole of the west of England, with the exception of the University of Bristol, which is a slightly different service because it's contracted directly to the university, so they set the fares. But um, in terms of those UE, Bath Spa, Bath Uni are all the same. Yes, they do get three weeks longer, but they don't get 24-hour bus services, and that was the kind of toss-up that we decided was the fairest way to do it, really. Um, hi, so I'm on the U2 route and I've only been here for a few weeks, uh, so I obviously can't compare it to last year. And I won't go into why there's no morning, late night or Sunday buses, because you've already said that that's also a resource um, problem. But basically, the buses that are scheduled, especially during peak times, they don't come or they are way too late or they come early or they're so full that no one can get on. Mm -hmm. So when you actually want to be at university for a 9.15 class, um, we now actually take the first bus, bus, which is at 7.30, and then we have to spend an hour here because all buses after 8 o'clock are not reliable at all. Um, and it's come to the point where I know people have uh, gotten a permit for their car to drive in by car rather than by the ticket, which obviously then um, makes the traffic heavier and pollution and you lose out on money. So just wanted to raise that. Oh, well, first of all, let me apologise that that's been your experience. The U2 is the one that causes us the most issue, really. So I won't, this is going to go into real technicals, and I will try not to do so, because bus people tend to do that, and nobody else is really interested. But the U1 and the U3 operate on a kind of frequent cycle, i.e. that we throw buses at it, and we, as long as we do more than six an hour, the uh, regulator's happy. The U2 is a registered service, i.e. it's got a timetable, but it also operates on some of the most congested roads in the region. And they're unpredictably congested, so you'll have seen that yourself. The Bradford Road, especially coming in past Wessex Water and Ralph Allen School, can one day be absolutely fine and sail in quite nicely, and the next day can be absolutely horrendous. And it does cause us a real problem, the U2. Um, the U2 is also the weakest of the three in terms of the revenue that it collects. Um, on a Saturday, the service, and in a summer holiday, the service is actually tendered by Bath and North East Somerset Council, i.e. that where a bus service isn't able to meet the commercial market's needs, which it doesn't, the local authority is empowered, not necessarily given the money to, but empowered to be able to provide that replacement. And they do, they directly fund that. They don't have any money to provide it the rest of the time or to fund any later evening journeys or Sunday journeys, unfortunately. And I don't wish to speak on their behalf because they're not here to answer that question but I know the answer, and it's that they just simply don't have the money. Wessex used to operate a 20C, which would be before you were aware of it, and that was funded by the council. That did run later into the evening, and oft sometimes I think did run on a Sunday. That was all cut back because of the cuts that the council had. So the U2 is a bit of a curious example. Um, we have, have tried where we can to try and regulate these buses to keep them in service. But again, the U2 is quite difficult to do that on because there's nowhere obvious to cut the route out. If you, some routes, for example, have a very quiet end of it. So I'll use an example like the X, well, the X39 is a terrible example, actually. Um, but a, a route in Bristol, say, that goes towards Cribs Causeway, actually the Cribs Causeway end at nine o'clock at night is probably quite quiet. So if the bus is running really late, we can cut that bit out and make sure that the bus in the core section remains on time. That's not so easy to do with the U2 because it's a circle. Um, it also gets stuck in a load of traffic and unfortunately has the problem of aged old kit on it. Some of the buses on that bus are probably older than some of you in the room. They're W Reg, they were bought in 1999. Um, they need replacement and unfortunately we have had a couple of issues, not massive, but a couple where they've broken down. All of that is a reason and not an excuse. That is not good enough for you as a customer and we accept that. What we actually do with the U2 longer term, I don't know, because we cannot afford to throw another two or three vehicles at it to make it work. But I will keep monitoring it, and next year I think we need to perhaps rejig the timetable again, which may make it slightly less frequent, but more reliable. And that might actually be the way to do it, i.e. it might not turn up every 10 minutes, it might be every 15 minutes, but when it does turn up, it'll be on time. So, I'm sorry. We're aware of the problem, and we are kind of trying to work on a solution to it. Yeah, I'm going to break down. I actually had that uh, 
um, as well. So the one time the bus was on time, or actually was three minutes early, we managed to get it, and after two stops it broke down. And then the bus that was supposed to come 10 minutes after took, I think, 22 minutes. So it took us an hour to get uh, here, although it should have taken 13 minutes. But All I can do is apologize, I'm yeah. afraid. And, <laughs> I appreciate it. The other thing that some people have done on the, don't forget that your ticket, if you've bought a day ride or a term ticket or, or an annual ticket, you can use the bus to go to the CC Centre and then get the U1 or U3. Some people that live in places like Moreland Road or in Whiteway have actually done that and found it quicker. So whilst I wouldn't wish you to stop using the U2, there are alternatives. The, any bus that you see in Bath with a first logo on it which is most of them, I think about 98% of them, you can use your ticket on that as well. So there, there are some alternatives, and afterwards maybe if you come see me and tell me where you live, I can see if there is one for you. Can I just make a couple of comments? I think the U2 is the, is the bus service that I hear the most complaints about in terms of reliability, uh, rather than with, with the U1 and U1, uh, U3. There, can, there used to be some concerns about capacity, whereas... The U2 is where the bus just doesn't turn up. You know, that, that seems to be the, the issue. I think um, it's good that you recognise that problem. Um, I think this is where your better data could really help uh, so that we understand much, much better the dimensions of the problem. And maybe we could work with you with some of our models and say, well, look, is there a better way of doing this? Is there a better route? I know the council are particularly keen to understand, for instance, where they might take obstructions out of the route. So that would reduce some of the congestion issues that you face. Now, I'm not sure how much of that could really help, but if we could work on all of those fronts, uh, I know it's the less popular bus out of all of them. It, it carries fewer passengers. Uh, but for some people, it's critical. And, um, and many of our students do live in places that rely on the U2. So I think it would be good to kind of explore that one a bit more in depth and, and I think to have a bit of transparency about what we're doing so that people understand what's going on and, and how, we're, how the thinking is developing. I think the, the, the one thing to keep in mind is that the council set a lot of the stuff for the U2 because of the tendering element. So that, as long as that conversation kind of involves them, I think they'd be quite happy. But they have the same problem we do and actually it's trying to get people past the traffic. And we've considered lots of different options actually, including one that doesn't do the big loop it does now and you split it in two and that the bit from Twerton and Whiteway actually then comes down through Oldfield Park and then onto the normal U3 track, perhaps. If you have any thoughts on the U2 and wanted to share them with myself or, or Rob, who's the operations manager there, or Sue afterwards, uh, that would be fantastic because we're, we're all ears, frankly. And can I say, if you have a problem on a particular day, if you can tell the, the GCLs, the, the guys in the yellow jackets, then what we can do is collect that data. It doesn't help us solve it for that day, but then we get a really good idea of, the, of how frequent the problems are occurring. And I know Mike can then, with his weekly meeting, collect all that, and I think you'll find that really helpful useful. as well. So I know it's a bit of a pain, but if you could let us know through the T-cells, that would be incredibly helpful. I was going to actually ask a question about environmental stuff, but I just wanted to go back to something you raised like 30 questions ago. Um, you mentioned that some of the Bristol services are tendered specifically by the university, and this might be a question for yourself, Steve, as well. Um, is that a model that's maybe worth considering at all? I mean, how does that work? Is there some kind of reason that it works specifically in Bristol, not Bath? I don't know. I'm just, it's just an interesting kind of throwaway thing you had at the end, and I'd like you to follow up on that, if that's all right. That's certainly a, a Steve question more than a Chris question, I think. I mean, we as an operator just do what... Yeah. Yeah, so I'll leave I, that to Steve. I, I will answer that, because it's a really good question, and you won't be surprised to know that I've been thinking about that, especially with the problems last year, because uh, one of the ways a free market works, if you're not happy with the delivery, you go find someone else. So uh, we went over and had a look at what they were doing in Bristol and in other universities. Now, the Bristol service effectively operates from Bristol University-owned halls of residence to the centre of Bristol. So it's a point to a point. It is a, a service that anybody can use, so that enables it to have access to some of the benefits of having a, a scheduled service. Uh, the students pay for it by an addition on their accommodation charge. So it's free at the point of use, but the students pay for it and they have no choice. They, they have to pay for, for, the, for the bus service. That's my understanding. 
Anyway, that bus service was tendered, as, and I think First Bus were successful in, yep. in securing so the, right. the contract. Um, it took them two years with a fairly re- relatively simple service uh, to be able to specify it properly and go through all the legal due diligence and the health and safety to get to that point. Uh, so it's not a simple thing to do. It does take, take a while. Um, I think they're very happy with the performance of that service, but the university does have to subsidize it by quite a bit. And actually, any, any money the university subsidizes is money that you folk pay because it all comes from tuition fees and elsewhere, so it's not spent on other things. Um, so you have, to be, you have to look at it quite analytically and say, well, what's, the, what's the really the best, the best option? Uh, but I would say, and this is by no means a threat or anything like that, that those options are on the table. And, you know, we will, we, if the service isn't very good, then obviously we'll look to see whether or not we would need to do that. At the moment, I have to say the service is excellent compared to last year, excepting the U2. And therefore, you know, it's not something uppermost in our mind. But we, we will be looking at that, keeping that in our mind. And that's the the leverage we have, if you like, to maintain a good service. So an excellent question and um, one that we're looking at and we're looking at throughout the country as well at what other universities are doing. Uh, and uh, there's not many. Some have said, why didn't you own your own bus company? Those that have have quickly sold it. I mean, we're not bus operators. These guys are. Uh, and, you know, we may be good at doing lectures and research, but we're not, we're not great at running buses. So... Uh, we'd, we'd, I think I would approach that with some degree of trepidation. If I can just add a little bit to that. Um, we, I mean, we've got the same problem, actually, that when we looked at the finances last year, and I've alluded to it already, you know, it didn't cover its cost of operations. Now, you know, we're not a charity. Um, we're a business. We, we have to cover our costs, and, and, and it would be nice if we made something from it to be able to reinvest. So, you know, we've, it's in our interest as well as yours to make it work and actually when we started our conversations with the university we found that our goals are the same for different reasons but we're coming from the same place that we want to make this service work financially without the need for anybody to subsidize it because subsidies are fleeting no matter who subsidizes it whether it be the government whether it be universities actually what we want is it to sustain itself so for now i think we are not prepared to kind of throw the towel in and say we can't make this work commercially here's our notice, we're no longer going to operate this service, which, you know, we're free to do. We don't want to do that. Um, so I think we're a bit early days, but so far, it's looking better. So I think we, we are focused at the moment on doing what we do and doing it as well as we can. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I mean, so far, the service, I was here last year, and that was... So when I was here in my master's, it was fine. Then my first year of PhD was pretty bad. And then this year, it's been fantastic, best I've seen. Um, but yeah, it was just an interesting thing you raised. Um, so carrying on with the kind of cost of operations in terms of making things more environmentally friendly, I thought one of the reasons that the route last year was taken out of town was in terms of the air quality through Dorchester Street. And now the kind of solution to that was just ignore the problem and send them through anyway. And if you're saying there's more buses going through, I was wondering how that problem is kind of being addressed. I know it's not really your concern in the slightest. Oh, no, it is very much our concern. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's not a foremost concern. You're not job first thing is to minimise carbon emissions. But is there any kind of consideration over the environmental effects other than that, which is statutorily kind of like forced upon you? Or I don't I know, mean, I'm just interested. There is no statutory requirement on us yet. Hmm. Uh, there will be. Um, but the... Look, we want to be good neighbours. We're, we're part of the community in Bath. We're not just people that come here and suck the life out of it. We, we live and work here. Uh, and actually, that's really important because we did pull it out for the right reasons. We had recognised that Dorchester Street and Mamba Street particularly had a, a real high problem with air pollution. And it's no surprise, stand on Mamba Street, you can see how many buses go along there and count how many of them are U1s and you soon see what the problem is. Now, buses are very much a solution to air pollution rather than a problem in some respects because for every person that's on a bus, if you imagine all those people had a car, it would suddenly be much, much worse than that. Um, that may be kind of politically sensitive sometimes, but actually it, it's a fact, you know, and other cities like London have demonstrated that more so onwards. We are looking at that, but one of the solutions we thought was, okay, well, we'll just pull the buses out of the city centre. People don't mind walking. Well, that was proved very well last year that that's not the case. So um, 
I think what, we've, what we're looking at now is how to upgrade the vehicles so that you can run buses through there without causing an air quality problem. And that's what we're working with the local authority on. That's, and there's lots of different ways. So in Bristol, we're about to receive delivery of 79 gas-powered buses that produce 80% less CO2. Other parts of First, York, for example, they're just about to take a delivery of a whole load of fully electric buses. These are the kind of things that we want to look at when we future model it. And that's the kind of work that we've been working with the university because, you know, you guys have experts on that subject. So I think the future is really interesting for that point. But at the moment, we had to deliver the service. And we are very aware of it. And we just try to minimise those issues where we can. We are incredibly, place an incredible amount of importance on reducing carbon emissions. Uh, we've just announced a new, uh, a new initiative to add impetus to the work that we already do. Um, we would like to see the total carbon emission from transport to and from the university by students, staff and visitors reduce. That's our objective. So we can work productively with the bus company to firstly reduce the emissions per bus journey but also to increase the number of people that elect to come by bus to the university. And one of the problems last year was in trying to do that when you haven't got a bus service that people find convenient and good and useful to use. It's hard to persuade people to come on the bus. So last year we had a reduction in, uh, we do an annual travel survey to figure out how many people use different methods of, of coming to the university. And last year we saw a reduction from 59% to 54% that use the bus. Now, some of those started to use the cycling, so that was a net gain. But some, I know, started to club together and use cars, which isn't a great idea in terms of carbon emissions. Now, it's difficult to say to them, well, you should use the bus when they find the bus service not good. But with the bus service improving, that div does give us a fantastic opportunity to get more people on the bus, to reduce the carbon emissions, and to help us achieve some of those, those targets. So... It is uppermost in our mind. It's a really important thing for the university. We do generate, as a university, a very high number, amount of carbon emission for the city, and we need to do better. So we would like to work with you, uh, with the bus company, to make that happen, and with our student population as well, to, to see how we can make it better. Um, is there anywhere I could access a cost breakdown for um, the bus service from first. So um, I'd be interested to see that, to analyse. This there's only certain things that we're able to produce, primarily because we're PLC, so our costs and kind of how we cost things is commercial. So we have competitors, and if we were to put our cost model out there and then went to tender for a service, for example, they could quite easily undercut us because they'd know exactly what our costs are. So I know that sounds like a horrible answer, but it, it's, I'm just being really blunt and honest, yeah. that we're, we're, very, we're, we're really not allowed to do that. That's the kind of thing I get fired for. Um, our costs aren't inflated, and, and the, it's, this isn't a case that I'm saying, oh, well, we only made 5% profit last year, and we need to make 25%. It's that last year we made negative something, and I just want to break even, because actually that's all we need to do for now. Um, whether we'll be owned by a PLC in the same way by this time next year or not, who knows, might be in a different place. But at the moment, I, there's going to be gaps in what I'm able to provide. But we, be, we are and we have been with the university and with the SU as upfront as we can be um, with that kind of thing to remain competitive so that we don't shoot ourselves in the foot, basically. Hi, this is a question directed to Steve mainly. Uh, given that the university is committed to uh, reducing carbon emissions mm -hmm. and knowing that public transport, public transport is the main way to go to reduce so many cars coming to campus uh, and everything, is the university prepared to scrap the multi-story car park that is currently in the campus master plan for this? Well, per perhaps I can just, for those who don't know, um, the local authority, that's the West of England Combined Authority and Baines, every five years or so produce a new plan for development in the city and in the local areas. We are producing a master plan for the university to feed into those two local plans. 
it has no status until the local plan is approved by the, universe, by the local authority. The local authority said to us, we want you to develop the university on its existing site and to increase the amount of student accommodation that you have on your campus. We are restricted to 2,200 car parking spaces on site. That is not going to change. That is 2,200 car parking spaces. But in order to create the space for potential future development, what you can do is two things. One, you can, in, you can have multi-story car parks. So that means you, know, you can park the same number of cars on a, a smaller area of ground. The ground that you release, you can then use for, for, for development. The other idea is that we produce 3G pitches, which I know is in the SU top 10, uh, but, but for that purpose, you can use a 3G pitch more extensively, more, more intensively than a grass pitch, which you can only use in some times of the year, once, twice a week. So we could then use one or two grass pitches for, for further development. So those are the two sort of extra capacity issues. But just to be absolutely clear, uh, those developments would not be allowed to increase the number of cars. They would still be fixed uh, at 2,200. So that, that would not have either a positive or a negative impact on the number of um, the, the amount of car emissions that, that come, on, come on campus. I would say just in case people, it's a slightly different subject, but just in case people think, oh, we are definitely going to build three multi-story car parks and all the rest of it. Um, there is the little question of how do you finance that and where the money is coming from and also how do you implement that over a period of time and keep the university running. So uh, it's in the master plan, but it's a capacity plan. It's saying this is what we could do if we had the money and the economics of that stacked up. So it's not a definite we will do, but it's what we could do. And if we did decide to do it, the planners would say, well, we've looked at it in general and the whole thing stacks together, the transport, the ecology, the lighting, all of that stuff we've thought through, and that would make sense. Kind of two things in one, almost a suggestion in some ways. But um, what, what's most frustrating for me, and I know quite a lot of other people, is that when we don't know what's happening, so if we're at a bus stop and um, sometimes the buses are on time, sometimes they're not, maybe, um, aside to that. If um, you, you know, I, I know there was a suggestion from a map, maybe, or, or possibility that we could see where all the buses were in Bath, as one thing. So if, I know, as one more thing, and then. Okay. Um, but if we could see where they were, then if we were at a stop and there were clearly none coming, then we could either walk or we'd get less, I think people generally would get less frustrated by bad times when they happen, inevitably, if we knew about them and we could, we could make other arrangements to walk or, or else. And secondly, whether on the bus stops you could put like little webcams on the key bus stops so that we could actually log in online and see, oh, Lawn Road, there's a queue halfway up the road. So maybe it would be better to walk or maybe it would be better to go into town and get the city U1, which is quieter because there's not many people waiting in the city. So actually that might help mm. you in terms of spreading us out better if we know where the queues are, and equally in terms of times. I know some people, it's quite flexible getting into uni. So if they see a huge queue at the bus stop, they'll be like, oh, I'll just leave it another hour and go then. I think that's a great question. I'll, I'll answer it in, in the two parts, hopefully in the same order that you asked them. So the, the first bit is there is a map available. It's not something we've actually created. Uh, it was created by some some wonderful bus enthusiasts, I believe they are. Um, so if you Google bus times U1, and it should be, it's normally the first or second um, result that you find. Uh, make sure you put Bath in there, by the way, otherwise you end up with Bristol U1 or Southampton U1 or something like that. And, and it will show you a map, and they've even color-coded the bus based on what color the bus is, and it updates itself. It's all open source data, so the tracking data that we provide is all open source. Somebody who's very clever has, has kind of put that into a website uh, we can do that ourselves. The, the information that's available publicly from us is tracked and on the bus stops, so some of them have the screens with the bus stop displays on them. Uh, that is facilitated and provided by the local authority. Uh, we haven't got any direct access to that system. 
which is a bit of a source of frustration for me and for you because um, it restricts our abilities to be able to communicate these things with you because it'd be nice to put the message on there saying we're a bit delayed but we'll, we'll get round soon or there's one round in five minutes we can't do that unfortunately um, so bus stops are a bit funny really in the sense that we don't actually own them nor do we have any influence as to what goes on them at all um, they are owned maintained facilitated by bath and north east somerset council that's not the same everywhere that's the case in the west of england uh, of which baines is part of um, i will certainly pass on that suggestion to them um, there's all sorts of complications about council funded cctv and data protection and whether you're allowed to see people on cameras or whether you're not. Something we've been working with them is, is to allow us to see it. So we can see, we have access to some of their CCTV um, so that we can plan traffic delays and stuff. But being able to see bus stops would be really, really useful um, because at the moment, the only way we know how to do it is, is the low tech way, which is having people on the bus stop. So some of you have probably seen people stood on Lawn Road bus stop that work for us and on Green Park, uh, Dorchester Street and the bottom of Bathwick Hill. Uh, there are regulators, they are bus drivers, and they communicate through WhatsApp to tell people where they are because radios don't work because you can't get radio to the top of the hill and back again. You end up being able to talk to Odd Dam Park and Ride, but nowhere else. Um, so, yeah, I think that would be a great idea. It's certainly something I can pass on to the Cabinet members for transport um, because I think that you, what you say makes a lot of sense. We have, however, changed the way we communicate with our customers a little bit in that we've created you a Twitter feed that you didn't have before, which is at Bath Unibus. That is updated by our operations team, so it's not a place to complain to, per se, because we don't necessarily be able to answer them on there, um, and I'll tell you that email address for those in a, in a little while. But the Twitter is there to give you updates. So, for example, when we had a problem yesterday with the rain and there was traffic uh, coming up and down Bathwick Hill all this morning, where we had issues with the recycling lorries and stuff like that, that was all published on our on the Twitter, so I encourage you all to follow it because it's, it can only be useful. Uh, it's something I'm not really supposed to have done because our head office like to do everything like that in central shared services, which is in Leeds, but uh, we, we kind of did it anyway and nobody's told me off so far and I haven't been fired, so that's a good thing. Uh, the, the way to complain to us is we've got an email address which I can give out to you, which I've got to try and make sure I get right, but I believe it is, you've got it on the screen behind me, there you go. So that's all the information you need. Uh, to be able to contact us, but the Twitter feed's a good way to do it. Um, one suggestion of a thought process is on your empty app when you carry your bag, if when you um, get on the bus, there was like a little option underneath that said how busy was the stop or how busy is the bus or something like that, so you could press, I had to wait 20 minutes, I had to wait 10 minutes, I had to wait 5 minutes. I that's certainly, that's I, certainly I don't an idea know. to put on our kind of wish list, definitely. You could incorporate that into your app, maybe, and everyone would have it open on their phones anyway, or yeah. most people, and then they could just press, you know, I waited 20 minutes, I waited 10, and that would be feedback for you, but also data that you could put on a graph on the app to show everyone really, else. At the moment, the app's provided by a, a kind of third party, um, so uh, we kind of buy that software off them, but as I alluded to, things will may be very different in 12 months, and that's exactly the kind of thing we might look at doing. So I think that's really useful. So thank you for the feedback. Can I, can I just say that we are installing some uh, screens. They're not there yet, but they will be there by November in the arrival square, which will give more information to passengers. Uh, different from the ones you see on the, the Baines operated, it's due in two minutes and it turns up in three or ten or whatever it is. Um, it, it will be more reliable, hopefully. But I think the points that you are making are really good points and um, I'm glad that it's on the agenda, Robin. We'd certainly like to talk to you about how we can do that because if we can better regulate or people can self-regulate their movement between buses, that helps everyone. Um, and um, I know there are some technical and legal challenges in doing it, but I think it's worth the effort. And we've got quite a few good brains here. I've got a few students who've actually offered, you know, can I do my project on how to do something similar to that? So we could maybe work together and see how we could make it work. Oh, yeah, we're a big fan of anything innovative that helps do what we do. Yeah, great. And we'll be looking for help. So I think I've kind of earmarked you already to help us. But, yeah, really good. Thank you. 
Thank you all very much. We're, we're kind of up against it with time, but I know both um, Chris and Steve are going to hang around. So if you do have, I saw some hands going up at the back there. If you do have some more questions, then please come down to the front uh, and uh, ask away. Uh, just a reminder, that there's some details up there for the information that Chris was just relaying. I uh, just want to say a very quick thank you to the team from Campus TV and for Tommy for helping out. Uh, but also thank you so much to, to Chris and Steve for coming along today. I think it's been really great uh, for them to both come down and to answer the questions that you've had so far. Can I, can I also just thank somebody who's not in the room, which is Eve, the student union president. I think did a fantastic job last year in putting the case to, to First and to us and to others. Um, and I know she can't make it today, but I'd, I wouldn't want the occasion to go without expressing my thanks to her. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Safe journey home.